Hello, Bible readers. As a Lutheran taught in the reforming tradition of Christianity, I find it difficult to resonate with the Psalms when the psalmist says things like, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Because I'm more like, please don't do that, because I genuinely believe I am a saint and a sinner at the same time. It's one of the most important theological understandings of the Reformation, that I cannot earn salvation with my own works, but that my hope comes from the righteousness of Jesus, because it is pure. And it comes from his willingness to pull me into that pure righteousness through baptism, so that I could live a life of faith. So Torah piety, that is following the law, as we've seen in these first seven psalms, laid out especially in the introductory psalms 1 and 2, Torah piety believes that one can remain innocent, if you will, by keeping the Torah. This is another courtroom kind of scene in Psalm 7, and the psalmist is saying, if there's wrong on my hands, do your worst. But since there's not, I mean, talk about confidence, when you judge, pull the wicked down, because that's not me. Well, the psalmist doesn't appeal to God's mercy or compassion because the psalmist doesn't need to. Instead, these psalms that are in the tradition of follow the Torah and everything will be hunky-dory, they don't call on God's mercy, but on God's justice. I am innocent, they are not, so do what you do, God. Be just. Can the Torah be fully kept? Is it possible to be righteous? I mean, it's an ancient question. So my Brueggemann and Bellinger commentary takes this on a little bit and would have us notice that in verse 8, the psalmist does say, judge me according to my righteousness. But in verse 17, the speaker says, I will give to the Lord that thanks due to his righteousness and will sing his praise. Uh, due to his righteousness and will sing his praise. The psalmist is not praising his self in that verse. He's simply claiming his own innocence, seeking what is due to him, justice. My commentary speaks to all this as though it's just about who emphasizes what. The psalmist does speak of God's righteousness, not just his own, and it doesn't have to contradict. They can both exist. As Brueggemann says, the my righteousness is situated completely in the context of and is encompassed by God's righteousness. In other words, even for this psalmist, their ultimate assurance comes not from their own righteousness, but from God's. So even self-righteousness for the Torah-keeping psalmist is not sufficient. That's why he's praying to God, after all. Following Torah may do as much as bring joy and bring peace in this life, but God is still, at the end of the day, the one who enforces the rewards system. So the psalmist is calling it in. How open will we allow ourselves, our theology, our understandings to be when we read the Psalms? That's the question that came to mind as I was like, hmm, my righteousness versus God's righteousness. Like, how open will we be so that we can pray the Psalms? So I wanted to get at some of this in my post on Psalm 6 as I talked about prayer as process, but I ran out of time. So here's a little more on that. And this comes from Brueggemann's little book on praying the Psalms. He says, praying the Psalms depends on two things. What we find when we come to the Psalms, that's already there, and what we bring to the Psalms from our own lives. Makes sense? He says, the work of prayer is to bring these two realities together. The boldness of the Psalms and the extremes of our own experiences, and then let them interact. Let them play with each other. Let them tease each other. Let them illuminate each other. The work of prayer consists in the imaginative use of language to give the extremes of our lives their full due, so that we would come to new awareness, new realities, all this work is a way of submitting to God in order that 
we may be addressed by a word, God's word, that outdistances all our speech, as imaginative as our speech may be, as extreme as our speech may be. His point is, the more extreme, the better, because God's word is able to outdistance all of our speech. See, Brueggemann believes that language, the use of words, like praying the Psalms, has the power to create. The belief that this is true comes from the Genesis description of God creating. Because how does God create? By saying, by, by speaking, right? God says, let there be light, and there is light. God speaks, the thing said comes to be. Well, we, our generation of humankind, we believe the function of language is to simply report on or describe what already exists. Language is a way to control what we experience. It's a way to control what we see, what we already know. Well, that is not how language gets used in the Psalms because that generation of humankind had a completely different understanding of what language could do. The Psalms don't describe what already is as much as they evoke what is not yet. Brueggemann says this kind of speech shuns precision, delights in ambiguity, is profoundly creative, and is itself an exercise in freedom. In using speech this way, we're doing what God did in the creation narratives. When we pray the Psalms, we are calling into being that which does not yet exist. Mm. Scientists, engineers, historians, they should be precise with language. They should use language to describe in an effort to control a narrative or directions or whatever. But the language of describing crushes hope because it can't imagine what is not already present. So in a lament, the psalmist isn't going to just describe. The psalmist almost always ends after saying things like deliver me or like a lion, they're going to tear me apart. They end by speaking the hope they seek. On their own heads, their violence descends. If we take the language of the Psalms to be descriptive, as though the psalmist is simply trying to report on how the hope they had came true, well, that would leave us reading these psalms thousands of years later with a sense of, okay, well, so, but what do I have to do to get the same outcome? Like, what happened between the lines of that psalm for the psalmist to go from plea to praise? The psalm has no power, really, if all it is is a report. Its power is not what happens between the lines. The power of the psalms comes from the words of the psalms. And when we speak them, we experience their creativeness. We see the surprises that pop up in the midst of the worst kinds of lament. A new reality can sprout up as we pray the words of the psalms, because in faith, we have been given holy imaginations that can change the world as God makes all things new. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places. 